Jeffrey Smith here. I'm with Denise Herzing, and we're talking about the Wild Dolphin Project and their 40th anniversary gala coming up. Is it March 15th? It's March 15th. Uh, you can go on our website, wilddolphinproject.org, buy your tickets. There's going to be a silent auction. There's going to be cocktails and dancing and storytelling and really cool people there, by the way, Na National Geographic photographers and and other semi-famous people. And it'll just be a fun event to relive our 40 years with the spotted dolphins in the Bahamas. And Jeffrey, we're in your beautiful gallery and you've done this beautiful painting of real individual dolphins that we've known for decades. And it's amazing to see it amongst your other beautiful work. Look at it. That, that is a beautiful painting. So the purpose of this painting is to raise money to continue with your research. So here you actually see um, the mothers are calves that I've known and I've known their mothers growing up. And so they're, they're, those are third generation calves right there. And you've known their parents and grandparents. Yeah, and yeah, the bottom one is Denny and her calf Dolby. Denny is actually my namesake. Ha <laughs> ha, how fun is that? Um, now, one thing I noticed on Denny, as you see, I tried to reduce it a little in the painting, but it was very prominent in all the photos, is that she had had a, um, a rope tied around her tail and constricted, scar. scarred yeah. up very bad. Yeah, that's one of her newer marks. She was originally identified with that little nick in her dorsal fin, which you actually painted uh, quite well. But yeah, I mean, they spend decades in the ocean and they do run yeah. into trouble occasionally. Yeah. Tell me about the collapse on the B Bahama Bank. Yeah, so in 2013, we monitored a big displacement of our resident dolphins of 28 years and they just picked up, half of them picked up and moved. And we were like, what would make a resident group of dolphins move like that? It had to be something serious because they were resident all year round for the most part. And after we looked at some oceanographic data, we saw that the chlorophyll had basically crashed, which is a proxy for plankton, which then you know feeds the fish. So we assessed that it was really a food crash and you got to eat, right? So that means you got to move if you're going to find food. Yeah, and unfortunately that's happening a lot of places on the planet for, between climate change and overfishing. These are the big issues for dolphins and whales everywhere. What are the, some of the solutions to, to, to that or, or how? Well, of course, you know, fishing is a huge thing. There's been a lot of overfishing over the decades. We now know that a lot of the fishing boats also turn their little uh, uh, trackers off so we can't even track the fishing. I mean, that's the first thing is you got to assess who's doing what and how much and where, right? So we have to reduce the commercial fishing. That's kind of number one. I mean, everybody can take part, you know, eat, maybe eat a little less fish or change your diet completely, perhaps, is another solution. Um, yeah, you know, we have to make room for animals on the planet because humans are just devastating a lot of their food sources on land, too, not just um, in the ocean. And the other thing that complicates it is if you pollute their environment, their habitat crashes, then they're really stretched for finding food, right? If they had a healthy habitat, that's everything, right? Nature's very strong if you give it a break and it could rebound. So that's actually probably the number one thing we could do is rebuild uh, seagrass beds. Corals, of course, are in trouble and there are scientists working on uh, redoing coral areas. Um, so habitat is everything to these animals and to a lot of the animals in the ocean, of course. I remember when uh, my children were very little, we went to one of these little marine parks in the Bahamas. I don't remember where it was, huh. but um, they talked about the dolphins and they said they needed three things to be, to thrive. They needed clean water, clean food, and lack of stress or predation. And that's all they needed. And I turned that around and I told it to my kids a million times that that's all we need. Right. We need lack of stress. We need a clean environment and we need clean food. And um, it's 
on the one hand very simple, on the other hand it's very complicated. Uh, but I, you know, that's what we need to. When we can save the dolphins, we can save ourselves too. I, I hope. Yeah, good point. I and mean, the other we're in Stewart, Florida, the sailfish capital of the world, and so when you say. Um, anti-fishing, people uh, raise their eyebrows. And I didn't say anti. No, no, no. I said reduce but, fishing. Well, I, uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll say it. Okay. <laughs> so the, to me, there's not hardly enough sport fishermen to, they don't add up to a hill of beans right. in the big picture. It's Agreed. not, it's not the sailfish fishing. It's not, you know, somebody catching a couple groupers on the weekend. Uh, it's these factory ships, yep. and these, and they're most of them aren't even from this country. Right. Uh, and what they do, not only over the overfishing, but uh, the slavery, the way they're run. I mean, there's nothing, you know, there's nothing good happens on a factory fish. And when you when you buy fish at the grocery store, most of it is either caught on a factory ship or it's it's produced in a septic tank in Asia, you know, tilapia and all that <coughs> under horrible, again, slavery conditions. Yeah. So. It's complicated. You know, we have a lot of mouths to feed on the planet and commercial fisheries is a huge issue. I think even in Florida, when there was a, a bill that came up to ban gill nets, that was quite a few years ago, and the fishermen got right behind it. They said, we want to fish. In the future, we can see the changes. It's negative. We want our fish too, you know, for sport or for eating. And they got behind the banning of the nets. That was just devastating the fish population. So, yeah, it takes all of us, I guess. We're looking forward to um, your big gala and um, what we can do to help. And hopefully, we'll find a nice home for this beautiful painting That's right. and, and raise, raise lots of money to help with your research. And um, tell us a little bit more when you go over to the Bahama Bank and you see these same dolphins year after year, but in addition to all your scientists, you do take um, tourists like myself. I'm not a scientist, you know. Yeah, um, sure. To, you know, so you have room. People can go on a um, spend the week with you and yeah we have quite an interesting group of people that come out um, they kind of function as citizen scientists we because we need help we need bodies on the boat to do dolphin watches they can help with data entry and they want to meet the dolphins so you know they come in the water with us we're pretty strict about how they act in the water so they don't disturb the dolphins because it takes a while to learn the dolphin behavior right so you're not disturbing the animals but yeah it's a it's a pretty nice setup it's worked well for us for decades, um, including people, and they become some of our biggest supporters too. They see the real thing. They see how much it takes to do the work, right? A lot of weather and, and boat stuff and finding the dolphins and, and all that, but it, it works quite well. Yeah, and we do a lot of things out there. You know, Primarily, we're photographing individuals so we can track who they are because they get spots with age, right? So we have to track them every year, otherwise, they kind of disappear in the population. And we're collecting genetic material to find out who the fathers are, doing paternity tests. And we do a lot of underwater video and sound because we're trying to crack the code of their communication to see if they have language. That's a new thing that's pretty exciting for us. Yeah, so we try to do whatever we can when we're out there and uh, 40 years and counting. What is the population, um, are, are they, dispersed around the world? Are they just in the Bahamas? And how, how many are there? So Atlantic spotted dolphins are only found in the Atlantic. Um, they have a cousin called a pantropical spotted that's found around the world, like spinner dolphins. But Atlantic spotted, they go from about New Jersey down to South America, and then across the Atlantic, you would find them um, France, kind of down to uh, Northern Africa. And we don't know how many there are. The data is poor because not a lot of people study them. Um, we're one of the few groups that have studied them, certainly long-term. So they're considered data deficient in the, um, the, the big books that track that sort people of thing. People call me data deficient. <laughs> <laughs> I'm deficient in other ways, but not data. But, so basically, we don't know. They're not well studied. Yeah. Um, there are some 
islands in the Caribbean and uh, places up Africa where they still hunt dolphins, including spotted dolphins, um, for some subsistence kind of hunting. So there, there are statistics on that, you know, how many they take and what age. And, but most of the time, um, we don't know a lot about their populations. Like we, we see them off the coast of Florida with the bottlenose dolphins sometimes. And we just don't even know, are they resident? Where do they go if they're not? So they have a different life here. You know, it's not the nice wide sand banks of the Bahamas. They have a restricted coastal, you know, uh, shallow zone. But we see them down in the Keys. Um, we've rescued a few of them, actually. Um, yeah, so they're all around trying to make a living, like all the dolphins, basically. So historically, there was about 100 plus in our normal group. So it's a small group, yeah. uh, small group. It's gotten a little smaller now. But yeah, 100 to 120 maybe every season. So and if they're reproducing, you know, normally they can you know, produce, I don't know, two to seven calves a year. So that seems to keep the population pretty in, in check, which and is And then good. the pods are how big? Because they, they're not all in one group? Or... Uh, no, we don't see 100 plus at a time. Our, our large group would be actually 20. That would be a decent sized group for us. We have seen maybe 50 or 60 occasionally. But yeah, they're more like hang out in groups of seven or eight. And they kind of get together with each other, then they separate, they get together. So it's, it's called a fission fusion society. So they, they mix it up. But they have preferred partners. They have preferred areas they hang out. So are they monogamous or they... Um, oh, Jeffrey, 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 Jeffrey. <laughs> <laughs> By no thought, means are I they thought, monogamous. I thought not. That's cute, that's yeah. cute. Are, they, are, they, are, the, are the pods run by... Um, is it a dominant male that runs it or a female? You know, or? again, we don't know. We, don't. we think it's uh, dominant by age, both female and male. Um, they have male coalitions that uh, fight each other sometimes. So there can be a dominant coalition, for example, of three to four males. And then the females, um, they can mate with multiple partners. And when we do our genetics, we see that the females have calves from different males. Yeah, they don't have a monogamous society. They're pretty promiscuous. They're in a big ocean, so it's not too conducive. But they have preferred partners and friends, for sure. Well, the so. sand, the beach, you can't blame them. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, that's true with most marine mammals. They yeah. just don't have long-term relationships with each other for mating, usually. But it seems to work because, like, they all take care of each other, right? They don't know whose calf it is. So it's like, oh, could be my calf, could be my brother's calf. So it makes for a very stable society in some ways. And the longevity, um, what's their, their lifespan and how long till they reach breeding age? Yeah, so females, nine to 10 years of age, they'll start getting pregnant and they can live into their 50s. That's not the average age, but they can live into their low 50s. So they have, gosh, the females have what, uh, 20, 30 years to produce, actually, so they can have many calves. And their calves stay with them for three to four years. So there's a lot of parental investment. Um, so that, again, helps a stable society. Yeah, and the 50 is, is probably, 52, I think, is the oldest that we've seen, or estimated that we've seen. And that's true with bottlenose dolphins, too. That's about as old as they get. So they have a pretty parallel life to us in, in many ways, right? And, the, you know, when a calf is born, if it has an older sibling, the sibling will learn to babysit, help oh, the mom. Wow. Okay. And often you, you'll see the grandmother with the mother and the calf. So there's yeah. a, it's a tribe, right? It's like it takes a tribe to, to raise these young dolphins and keep them healthy. Well, that's awesome. So thank you. What's um, one more? crass commercial message for the <laughs> wild dolphin project what yes the, when is the uh, the gala come join us it's march 15th 2024 at the pelican club in jupiter and we'd love to have you it's going to be a big reunion a big party celebrating telling stories i'll probably get roasted but that's okay um, yeah so it'll and, be fun um, so what's the to get in touch, your, what's your phone? What's the phone number at the office? 
561-575-5660, or you can go to wilddolphinproject.org. And there's a website uh, created by Melissa, a beautiful website, and there's a link there for the 40th anniversary, and there's barcodes, and it's all good. And get your tickets. <laughs> and join us. It'll be fun. We've got a lot of things planned, so hopefully we'll have some boat rides. We have another day of a more casual event as well, so just be in touch.